morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. I'm going to read just a little bit from Mark chapter 7. The source of your pollution in the Message Bible. The Pharisees, along with some religious scholars who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around him. They noticed that some of his disciples weren't being careful with ritual washings before meals. The Pharisees, Jews in general, in fact, would never eat a meal without going through the motions of a ritual hand washing with an especially vigorous scrubbing if they had just come from the market, to say nothing of the scourings they'd give jugs and pots and pans. The Pharisees and religious scholars asked Jesus, why do your disciples flout the rules showing up at a meal without washing their hands? And Jesus answered, Isaiah was right about you, about frauds like you, hit the bullseye in fact. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's command and taking up the latest fads. Down to verse 14. Jesus called the crowd together again and said, Listen now, all of you, take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life. It's what you vomit. That's the real pollution. And when he was back home after being with the crowd, his disciples says, We don't get it. Put it in plain language. And Jesus said, Are you being willfully stupid? <laughs> don't you see that what you swallow can't contaminate you? It doesn't enter your heart but your stomach. And it works its way through the intestines, and it's finally flushed. That took care of dietary quibbing. Jesus was saying that all foods are fit to eat. And he went on. It's what comes out of a person that pollutes. Obscenities, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deception, decept deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness. All these are vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. So we have no fear about what's around us, even about what comes in us. We need to have careful thought about what comes out of us. And our mouth is a powerful instrument. And again, we all know that, you know, that's the, that's the crux of it, right? When, when we feel those things, what comes out of our mouth, when we're in those situations, what comes out of our mouth? Is it the word of God? Is it truth? Or is it frustration? Is it us getting caught up? And it's so easy. Ooh, I have a temper. I do. Not everybody's seen it, but <laughs> I have one. A long fuse and a big piece of dynamite at the end. But we all do, right? We all do. But we need to be heartful. And, and, I, and I know that whatever we're around tends to kind of pile up in our hearts. What we listen to, what we watch, you know, those things, we have to be careful to make sure they get flushed out and they don't stick around, right? Amen. And what is it we're feeding ourselves? You know, if we're talking about nourishment, or are we talking about junk food, right? We're talking about steak, or cotton candy, the stuff that entertains but doesn't nourish. You're never satisfied after eating a bunch of junk. You may enjoy it for the first few bites. It may be ple pleasure, pleasurable for the first couple bites, but it doesn't really satisfy you. Left hungry. Within 10 minutes, you're feeling sick to your stomach and getting a headache and wishing you would eat something of nourishment. So I just encourage you guys to. I guess, listen to what people say around us. We have wisdom that not everybody has. We have the, the source of wisdom that abides in us and gives us revelation. The people that say the meanest things, that do the meanest things, are generally the ones crying out for truth and for love. You know, we have a peace that we can hold fast to. We have a God that encourages us and, and gets us through those hard times. You know, and it, and it seems like every time that I'm dealing with someone that I just pray <laughs> will be removed, they're never removed, are they? Uh. They're never removed. And it's not always a lesson for us. Maybe we're the only one that knows him that this person has access to. Yeah. And if we can remove ourselves from the situation, suddenly God can move. God can touch someone who may not ever get a chance to hear about his love, about his grace about his mercy, because there's churches filled with people that don't know his grace and his mercy, that just know his rules, that know how to wash their hands before a meal, that know how to say grace before a meal, but don't know the one they're talking to. And so it is precious. It is precious. And so anyway, be encouraged. Know that the source of your pollution.
soccer team and speaking, and uh, I know she got filled uh, Wednesday night. Pray for her uh, return and uh, to continue on. Thank God that uh, he's come to uh, an understanding that Jesus did it all. Uh, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, uh, his grace is covering it all. Uh, just got to believe. Thank you, Rick, for coming back. And he's brought a friend with him. Thank God. Do you want to introduce Rick? Or? That's my girlfriend, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Welcome. Glad you're here. Praise sure all the intentions were good and pure, um, but I guess after I was confirmed, uh, you know, I go to church from time to time and I, in my younger life, and I felt, I felt good about it when I, I went to church, but um, just coming here today, you know, things on your mind, and just uh, peace and truth, um, and I, you and Rita really appreciate this church for that.
this morning to worship, worship you, Lord. to say that we love you, Lord, to say that we choose you this day, that we will rejoice and be thankful, Lord, for all the blessings, Lord, that you chose us, Lord, to be your sons and daughters, Lord, that you chose us to be vessels of light and hope in this world that is so full of darkness. We thank you, Lord, that you chose us to be members of this body, Lord. We thank you for this safe place to come, to lift up your name, to worship you, Lord. Lord, that you are good. You are good. You are good, Lord. You are good and worthy to be praised, Lord. Thank you for your grace that upholds us, for your mercy that overlooks us. You are good, Lord. That you cover us, Lord. That you inhabit our hearts, Lord. Jesus, inhabit our praise this morning as we come together, Lord, in your name, in one mind and one accord, in Jesus' name. Get ready to worship. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. You are worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, those that aren't here today, I just pray for an anointing upon their lives right now, but I believe some of them are out in the field doing his work right now and praying that uh, the Lord would work mightily through them, that we would hear a good report, 
that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would be revealed many lives this day and that they would come back. That they would come back and give the testimony of what's going on. Hallelujah. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord Praise 
back from the grave. Um, Martin uh, Taylor, who makes uh, high-end guitars and stuff like that, told this furniture maker in Japan in the 1970s, he said, knock it off. Your guitars are too much like ours, so knock it off or we're going to sue you. Well, anyway, this furniture guy, he backed out and everything else, and, and I didn't know any of this until about a week ago, and it wouldn't tune right, and I said, Lord, there's a gem sitting in here in this pile of coal. What do you want me to do with it? He says, get it fixed, straighten it out. So I was led by the Lord in a few situations to be able to get this rascal back online. I learned I learned worship and warfare on this. All right? I don't know if many of you know what worship and warfare is. It's when we just take it right on from the earthly realms and just right on the throne room of God. Just to, So we're going to, we're just going to love on the Lord. Right. He brought it back in and, uh, we're just going to praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Mercy taught us how to dance, to celebrate with all we have, and to dance, to thank you for mercy. You taught me, you taught me how to shout, to lift your name in all the earth, and we'll shout to praise of your glory. Help me out, Suzanne. Yeah. 
Yeah. 
Be free. Be free. Jesus did it all. Come on, church. He did it all. He did it all. Thank you, Jesus.
out to the Lord right now, you can receive whatever you came here with the need for. Maybe it's something that's been so long in your life that you've kind of just given up and decided to just live with it. But I'm telling you, the glory of the Lord wants you to be set free. Set free. And I'm not talking about just addictions. I'm talking about fear and anxiety, unbelief, worries about family that, that are not saved. But God says, for us who are believers, we and our house shall be saved. Praise God. Whatever the, whatever the issue, whatever the, the unresolved circumstance, receive it by faith right now and allow the glory of the Lord to be revealed in your life. Praise God. He's a great and a mighty God. Nothing is impossible with Him. If you can believe, all things are possible. Hallelujah. He wants you blessed beyond your wildest imagination. He says that he has things for us that we have not even imagined or dreamed of yet. Praise the Lord. He wants to do way more for you than you even think you have need of right now. He wants to bless you abundantly that you might be a blessing in every area of your life. Hallelujah. We receive it in Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. You are a great and a mighty God. Praise God. There's none like you, Lord. We praise you for your mighty acts. Hallelujah. For your excellent greatness. For who you are, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, 
Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Let's all say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Thank all of you for being here. Amen. If you're a first-time visitor, praise the Lord. We appreciate you being here. Hope you'll come back and be with us in the future. Amen. If you're a, an old-timer, just keep hanging in there. Praise the Lord. We Summertime is vacation time, so obviously a lot of people are, are not here. But that's okay. Hallelujah. The Lord is here to minister to those that are here. Hallelujah. Praise God. And uh, we're grateful for every one of you that are here today. Praise the Lord. And I believe God wants to bless you. Amen. It's his desire to give you the desires of your heart. Amen. To bless you exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Hallelujah. I appreciate the testimonies. Thank you, worship team, as always, and the Sunday School Department. If they haven't already left, they can go. And uh, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, some of the things that we're just testified to. In fact, it never ceases to amaze me that when Suzanne's speaking up here or uh, Tim or Eric or Don or whoever, you know, gives a testimony, it always, there's always a resonating there. Uh, the spirit, you know, we all have one spirit. It's the same spirit, praise the Lord. It's the spirit of God. And he bears witness with our spirit. And that's what's so powerful about testimonies. I know some places people think, ah, oh, they're just wasting time. And Listen, some of the most powerful things that happen in a church service happen when you're talking. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. That's the Holy Spirit. If God's going to verbalize, he's got to have somebody to speak through. And a lot of times, the, what we think of as just off the cuff is, is the unction of the Holy Ghost. It's natural for us to just th say things and think, well, you know, I just said that. Well, you don't say anything without some influence by God. God lives in you. God dwells in you. It, just, it, it may not sound like some deep, deep theological uh, expression, but most of that stuff goes right over our heads anyhow. It's the things that come from a person's heart that really reflect what God is trying to exp express through us and to us. Uh, when the scripture talks about forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, especially in these last days. Listen, we need the witness of the Holy Ghost amongst ourselves and between ourselves because you don't find it out there. The only witness you're going to get out there is a world that is dead and dying and miserable and looking for hope and looking for help. Praise the Lord. So we need to build up our most holy faith, and we do that just the way we have done already this morning. Amen. By sharing with each other what God is doing in our life, what we expect him to do, what we want him to do, what we want you to agree with us for him to do. Amen. It sounds crazy when you talk like this to the world, to people that are unsaved, who are not believers. And they think you just came from another planet. Well, in fact, we have. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Hallelujah. We love the world, the people that are in it, but this isn't our home. So if we seem a little alien, it's only because we are. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We just are. We are uh, children of God. Hallelujah. In an earth suit. Praise the Lord. Just so that we have access to this realm, to this dimension, amen, the natural world, the way God operates through us so that he can touch others, amen, by the spirit, hallelujah, when we got born again, we got a brand new spirit, hallelujah. our bodies and our minds, they all function on a very basic level, the five senses, everything about your body testifies to the, to the natural world, it, it wants to respond to taste, touch, smell, sight, it, it wants to respond to every circumstance and situation that it's confronted with. And your mind, unless it has been renewed, and only to the degree that it has been renewed, it, it reacts to those senses. And it brings up a logical, natural kind of assumption or, or expectation as a result of that. But your spirit, you see, your spirit is not bothered by any of this. Your spirit knows Everything's good in God. And so whatever the body is sensing, 
the mind, it, if the mind is renewed to the word of God, which is what your new nature is and your, your new spirit, it will eventually begin to acknowledge the truth of your spirit rather than the facts of your flesh. Right. We're not denying facts. We're just saying there's something greater than facts, and that's the truth. The fact is you may be in some financial hardship this morning. The truth is, my God supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory. That's the truth. Now, come on, either we believe the Bible or we're all wasting a lot of time. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Your body may be aching. You may have some aches and pains as we get older. We find out we got joints we didn't even know we had. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I thought this thing was on a swivel for so long, and I'm finding out it actually has an e-stop. Praise the Lord, it's getting narrower and narrower, hallelujah. I don't know why, but I know that the Lord said, by my stripes, you're healed. I'm already healed, hallelujah. Now, I may not manifest every bit of that, but it's still the truth, even though I'm dealing with some other facts, right? And all of us got something. I mean, we all, some of us got multiple somethings. And, and relationships and other issues, come on. Amen. But the word of God says he restores all things to us. He makes us whole. Praise God. That's our testimony. That's what we have to declare. That's what will change things. Amen. That's why we, we, we read the scriptures up here that have kind of been, you know, given a, a more natural translation just so that we can speak what the word of God says about our circumstances. It isn't, this isn't a, a ritual as much as it is a way of trying to get our minds to think differently about our circumstances so we can speak in agreement with God about those situations instead of agreeing with our senses all the time. We are not, we're, the last thing we are are, are physical beings. We are spirits. We are spirit beings. We've been born again. That's who we really are. We just happen to have a body for a vehicle. We gotta, you got to have a body on this planet. You're not legal here without one. Amen. That's why God, who is a spirit, had to robe himself in flesh in order to come here to redeem us. He had to do it legally. Right. Amen? Amen? So his body now is still here. It's called the church, and it's each one of us, and it's all of us collectively. But we cannot fall into the trap that natural man does, and that's think that everything is about this. Right. It's not about this. We've got this for one reason, because we had to have access into this realm. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. And God has given us a mind, and only if we renew our mind to the Word of God can our mind be of any real you know, a, a, a help to us. It's logical. Even, even, even people who, are not, who don't have high IQs still deal with logic. I mean, they still respond to you know, whatever past experiences have you know, resulted in and so on and so forth. Praise God. That's not who we are. That's what everybody else is. So that's why whenever you begin to respond to the Spirit and act out from the Spirit, you don't fit in the usual social gatherings. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You seem kind of bizarre. You seem kind of weird and strange. Not because we're trying to be. You just are. You tell somebody that's going through a sickness, you know, God's healed you. Well, you, you might get run out of the hospital room or get blamed for, you know, their issues and circumstances. Likewise, people are struggling with other issues, and you, and you try to speak the word of God into their life, and there's all this resistance, you know. Like, are you crazy? You don't, you're not hearing me. You're, you don't know how bad I feel, you know. You don't understand how... My economic situ situation is so severe. You just you're, you don't you're not hearing what I'm telling you. And we're saying, praise the Lord, God will provide. But you know, here's the thing about God. Anytime God is speaking to you, it's going to require faith on your part. If it's God talking to you, it's going to require faith, yeah. or it ain't God, because right. the only way you access from God is by faith. So you think sometimes God is telling you to do stuff and you're kind of fearful and you're thinking that's so impossible. That's a pretty good sign it's God. 
because he requires faith and courage to experience anything in that realm, in that dimension. You've got to step out of the facts and into the truth. And nine times out of ten, that truth will be supernatural. It won't be recognized or, or accepted by the natural world around you. But it's more real because it existed before this and it will exist after. It's eternal. This is all temporal. It's here and it's gone. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. Everybody say praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. And we are so blessed, hallelujah, to be his children. Hallelujah. Whether we feel it or don't feel it. Amen. I heard him saying this morning, we ought to be so blessed and recognize how blessed we are. I, I just talked to a young man out here this morning, was out on the front steps, uh, broke, no home, no job. And of course, what he wanted was money. <laughs> I thought of uh, uh, Peter and John, you know. I gave him a few bucks, all what, what I had. But, uh, and I told him, I said, this isn't for me, this isn't charity. This, just God loves you, this is God. This is what God would do. I mean, this is what God wants to do. So get yourself something to eat. But he's not sitting here, you know. He's not, you know what I'm, you understand what I'm saying? I get it. I understand that, and I'm not, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying they're missing the fact that a few dollars or a lot of dollars is not the answer. Amen. They need this connection with Jesus. Amen. Amen? It's the old cliche, but it's true. You know, feed a man a fish, and you fed him for one meal. Teach him how to fish, right. and he can feed himself for the rest of his life. Right. That's what God wants to do. He doesn't want to just bless us. He wants us to understand how this relationship can work so that we, all of our needs will always be met, so that we can always stay connected to the source, right. to Jehovah Jireh, to the provider, right. amen, and how to access that provision by faith, amen. Yeah. God, it's not God's desire to see anybody humiliated and embarrassed and living beneath what God wants for them. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. That's a, that's a good thing to know. Mm -hmm. Amen? Well, there may be tough times. You may have to do some stuff you never wanted to do in terms of work and jobs and so forth. But God has promised that he's going to provide for us. And even more importantly to me at my age, he's promised that my seed is not going to be going hungry either. My children, my grandchildren, he's going to provide for them. Right. Amen? Right. All right. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Amen? Everybody say praise the Lord. Amen. So, uh, we've talked about this before, but uh, I don't think it's uh, coincidental that we're dealing with it still. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. The word of God, right? right? And a lot of times we think we got it and we amen it until the next crisis. And then we realize, I had some information there, but I'm not so sure I had revelation. Mm -hmm. You know, information will just mess you up. Right. You know, you, we, how we always say, he knows just enough to be dangerous. Right. You know, Don, you had guys work for you that just knew enough that you thought, my God, give them a, a wrench and a set of gauges and they could blow up a whole <laughs> block, you know. And we all have experiences like that where... We need revelation. Information is not enough, praise the Lord. The church world, the religious world is filled with information, theological information, but it sets nobody free. In fact, it makes people deeper into bondage and, and, and less free, and therefore their relationship with God is, is uh, hindered, amen? And that's what we're talking about uh, to some degree this morning. So we need to see who we are and where we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And then from that position, we see Christ, who is our life, appear. Let me repeat that. So we need, to, we need to see who we are in Christ and where we are in Christ, because in that position is where we will see Jesus appear. 
Jesus isn't going to appear in your religious efforts. Suzanne quoted the scripture or read the scripture this morning. Jesus isn't going to, God's glory is not going to be revealed through rituals, through religious, through religious rote and, and keeping of rules. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we see Christ then who is our life. He'll appear and we will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And glory isn't off in heaven somewhere. Glory, we were just singing before I got up here, Bring, let your glory come down here. You know, as it is in heaven, we want it to be here on earth. God said his glory is going to fill the entire earth. It's, you know, all of it. Even as the waters cover the sea. Praise the Lord. And we're going to be seen with him in that glory. He has to use us in order for that glory to be re released. I heard people talking this morning. You know, the, the world needs to see God as a person. They need to know that God is a person. How's that going to happen? It can happen by you representing God as a human being. Not as a religious crackpot, but just as a human, as a man. Like Jesus did. You see, Jesus... and. Yes, he was a religious person. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher of the law. But he presented it in a way like it had never been presented before. He was under the law. The people of his day were still under the law. Amen? But he presented it as a man to another human being, not as some, you know, higher level hierarchy that just looked down and kind of belittled everybody else. Praise the Lord. We know Jesus as a person because we have a personal relationship with him. But the world doesn't know that. When they think of God, they think of some angry, vaporish, you know, weirdo, strange, maybe at best bearded old man that's really mad and floating around just kind of like the devil looking for whom he may devour, waiting for you to screw up so he can slap you down and make you miserable. When in fact that's such a totally opposite reality and picture of God. Jesus came so that God could be revealed. And everywhere he went, he did good things. He went about doing good. This is God in the flesh. It's a man, but it's a man who is totally representative of God. And let me tell you this. When you get to heaven, the only God you're going to see is Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's seated on a throne. Glory to God. The right hand of the Father. We used to say that. Well, if God takes up all space, how big is that right hand? And how far do you have to go to get to it? Amen? You understand what I'm saying? There is a person, God. A God person. And that man is Jesus. And that's who we're going to see in heaven. Amen? I'm not saying that God doesn't take up all space and that God is everything. I'm saying the only manifestation we're going to see of that God in terms of form is Jesus Christ. So it'd be a good thing to develop that relationship right now. Praise the Lord. So when you step in, and it's going to be this way, you step into his presence, and it's not going to be like, oh, my God. It's going to be, oh, my God. Hallelujah. You know, you're going to feel so at home, so at peace, so, so accepted. None of this guilt and shame and kind of, you know, like we used to tell you about the guy who didn't work all week. He had to back into the pay line because he's too embarrassed to walk up and get his check, you know. Apparently, you all work with just really great people. Hallelujah. And I, I was with all the deadbeats. Somewhere they're saying that about me right now. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and verses 8 through 10. Now, this is interesting because this is, uh, again, something that was, we were just talking about prior to church. See, the problem with the world is they've got a guilty conscience. Unless they're sociopaths, uh, they've got a conscience. And that conscience eats at them all the time. Mm -hmm. That's why they stay drunk. That's why they stay high. That's why they, I'm not saying there isn't recreational drinking. There is another thing. I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm not condoning or ridicule. I'm just saying... But people, people who are, have this addictive kind of behavior, it's because they got issues, conscience issues. They may not even be their own. 
but they could be things that have been projected on them by poor parenting and you know situations and circumstances uh, out of their control. But I'm just saying, praise the Lord, a guilty conscience, see, you can't do anything about it. And that's what these scriptures, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present. In other words, it represented Jesus. It was a, it was a type and a shadow of Christ. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that, what? Could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So all of the rule keeping, all of the ritual, all of the sacrifices never dealt with man's guilty conscience. It never could go that far. They still had a guilty conscience. Amen. They, no matter how many sacrifices, which stood only in, and here we go with the other half of that, that was spoken by Suzanne, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. All of that stuff produced nothing in terms of what the human condition was. Right. Amen? It was all off in the far, far future of eternity. You got it? Mm -hmm. Look at verse 14 then, if you can, uh, Sheila. I'm just skipping this just to, for the sake of time. But how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Now, we're no longer in this equation. We're not bringing a lamb. We're not bringing doves. We're not bringing bullocks and goats. And we're not offering wave offerings and weed off. We're not doing anything now. Here is that sacrifice that all that other stuff was pointing to. Christ himself, amen, offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, what that tells me is we can't really serve God through our efforts, through our works. Amen? And in order to really have the relationship with God that God wants us to have, our consciences have to be purged from that. So that we can have now what we know we will have in eternity. And that is total peace and acceptance by God. So that we can run to him as he runs to us like the prodigal son. And the father, you know, the kid had his whole, you know, complaint list made up and his excuses and his, you know, you know, please forgive me and just make me a servant. And the father runs and hugs him, falls on his neck, kisses him, says, my son that was gone is now home, he's alive, and, you know, pours the stuff out on him, you know, the robe, the, the shoes, the whole works, the ring. That's, that's the problem we have as Christians. Sin consciousness. Right. Amen. Sin consciousness makes us no better than the sinner in terms, uh, in terms of what we receive from God. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. That's why our feeble attempts at religious works were simply to show us you can't do what you need done. Right. And we've talked about it before. It's like looking in the mirror, right? And you look in the mirror and you see your hair's all messed up. The mirror don't comb your hair. Right. It just shows you your hair is messed up. That's the way the Word of God is. The law teaches you that you're coming short, but it doesn't do anything to change it. Right. It just keeps showing you your lack of ability to be accepted or, or, or redeemed through your efforts, right. leaving you always frustrated, always with a guilty conscience. But if we ever really get to understand what Christ has done for us, we no longer have a sin conscious. In other words, we're not even conscious of sin. You say, but I still don't say it. See, if there's no, if there's no speed limit out here, you cannot get a ticket for speeding. And we are no longer under the law who have trusted in Christ. In other words, there is no law for us. The law still exists. It still has a purpose, but it's to bring those who are not in Christ to a place of exhaustion and to a place where they will give up their trying and their effort out of, out of uh, you know, 
thinking that somehow whatever they're going to do is going to bring them closer to God and bring them to the end of themselves to where they have to then turn to God for their salvation, for their redemption. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let's, let's go then to Mark chapter 7. And we'll just read verses 6 through 9 since uh, Suzanne already took care of the rest of it for me. Praise the Lord. I don't have to go through all of that. Amen. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. Of course, she was reading from, the I think, the Message Bible. But this is the old King James. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that, me, that you may keep your own tradition. That's external stuff. Mm -hmm. External washing. Ritual. External behavior. Thinking that that somehow enhances your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. When you go back to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where we opened up, I want you to understand what this is. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You want to know what that is? It's talking about washing by the water of the word. Not external washings, but something that needs to take place inside of us. That's the washing that God's interested in, the washing by the water of the word. Praise the Lord. All right, look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Lots of scriptures, but that's what we need is to have our minds renewed to the word of God, not just my opinion or somebody else's opinion or suggestions. But what is God actually saying? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's an internal thing. Praise God. The renewing of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. All right. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Familiar scripture. We've talked about this many times. But it's uh, appropriate now because it's in the context of what God's trying to show us this morning. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we're not changed by the stuff we're doing. We're changed by the Spirit of the Lord as we behold Christ, the finished work, right? Amen. Amen. It's not about us. Praise God. We've got to continually look into the mirror of the Word of God and not behold how bad we are. Praise the Lord. There's, a, there's something else going on here. You're not supposed to be looking into the mirror of God and seeing how you're falling short or missing the mark. Not as believers. That's for the unbeliever. Once you've been born again, you don't look into it that way. We look into it and behold the glory of the Lord. Praise God. We look in to be told who we are in Christ. And it can build us up Hallelujah. In our most holy faith, so we can begin to walk in what the Word says we are. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, this is dramatic, supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Not the work of us. Not the effort. We've already read the Scriptures. All of that sacrifice, all that stuff. Never did anything to, cl to, to clear the conscience. But the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to be no longer conscious of sin. Now, just think about it for a minute. If you, if you never thought about your sinning, you know, I mean, you're coming short. Now, I'm talking about now that you're born again. You're saved. But we still screw up. Sometimes we screw up intentionally. In fact, I would venture to say every time we screw up, it's intentional. You know, you got to think a thing before you can do the thing. It's just that it... Our brains kind of play tricks on us sometimes, and we think it was a kind of sneak attack, but it's just, you know, we're subtle. But we do stuff all the time 
that doesn't measure up to the rules. Right? Praise the Lord. And what, what God is trying to get us to understand, we, we need to have the confidence that I, when, when it happens, I don't think of it as sin. You know, the, the, the idea that you have to repent every time you do something wrong, give me a break. There aren't enough hours in the day, minutes in an hour, amen, for you to repent of everything. Now, you might get the big stuff, the ones that bother you the most, but you're not going to cover it all. Not if just thinking about some things is the same as doing those things. Oh, my God. You'd have to be like me and not even think a lot of times. Just no thinking. Just blank. Just like the cat looking out the window. My wife says, I wonder what they're thinking. I said, nothing. That's why they can sit there for eight hours. They're not thinking anything. They're cats. They don't think. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They're not even self-aware. They don't even know they're there unless you reach out and touch them. You know what I mean in, in terms of the, how they relate to things around them? Ne well, never mind. This is enough of animal <laughs> kingdom this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's the way God wants us to be about us. Not conscious of sin. Now, here's my point was that I got off on that weird little story, is that if you had no consciousness of sin, you'd never question whether God was going to bless you or not. You'd expect that God is going to do something really good for me because I'm perfect. Because I don't sin. And he's trying to get us to understand that just like Jesus is, so are you in this present world. So that you're not conscious of your human failures. You're only conscious of your spiritual perfection. That's who God's dealing with anyway. Amen. And through that spirit man, the, where the kingdom resides, everything flows. Praise God. Do you understand why it's so important that we understand the mind of God concerning these things? Because otherwise, even though we're born again, we're not getting any benefit until we die. Because we're still guilty. We're still guilt-ridden by every stupid thing we do and say. When God has said, I'm not looking at any of that. So you shouldn't be looking at it. Oh, you say, well, praise God. That, that'll turn this into total chaos. Well, let me clue you in on something. It's been total chaos since day one. Because it's people. The way the chaos ends, the way we live holy is by beholding him, not us. Praise the Lord. If we walk in the truth instead of the facts, this comes down not just to how you feel or what's in your bank account, but what you look like. Right. Understand what I'm saying? How your religious you know, life is expressed. There's a fact. The fact is you are a new creation, a child of God, Amen. beloved of the Lord. Amen? An heir, and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's a fact. And excuse me, that's the truth. Now the facts may be declaring something different altogether. The fact is you may lose your temper. The fact is you may swear once in a while. The fact is you might freak out and do something really stupid. But the truth is still the truth regardless of whatever the fact is. And that's what God is trying to get us to understand is to... Walk in the truth, amen, instead of in the facts. And when we do that, from that position, we can mortify our members. You're not going to mortify your members, if I were to go back to those scriptures, which you all are aware of anyway, by beating yourself up and, you know, denying yourself food and all this kind of other, you know, just go lock yourself in a convent or a cloister someplace. That doesn't help anybody. We mortify our flesh by not paying any attention to it. Right. It's not alive. We are alive in Christ. As far as God's concerned, this body's already dead yeah. in relationship to Him. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We're not trying to rehabilitate. Amen? 
I'm not trying to modify your, your old nature. Praise the Lord. I'm not, the flesh, in other words. What we're trying to do is recognize our place in this new creation. The new man. That's what we're supposed to be focused on. The devil wants you focusing on the flesh. That's why I know sickness and disease comes from the enemy. Why? Because he wants you focused on your senses, the five sense realm. That's where he rules. He is the God of this world. Little G, but that's where he, he, he rules and reigns in the temporal. Praise God. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 30. Praise God, hallelujah. He must increase, but I must decrease. Remember John the Baptist, when, when Jesus, all of a sudden, the followers started going to him, and, and uh, his disciple, John's disciples come and said, hey, what's the big deal here? How, he's baptizing more people than you are. And John simply answers, he must increase, but I must decrease. So the new man is to increase, right? The old man is to decrease, right? I mean, that's clear enough. But here's how religion does it. We've been trying to decrease and then hope that he'll increase. Amen? And we've got to emphasize him. Praise God. We've got to emphasize him increasing in us. You understand? Praise the Lord. Amen. And as he increases, I will automatically decrease. That's the scripture that he's actually given us there in Colossians uh, chapter 3, uh, where he says, you know, we are dead. And our life is hid in him. And the more we become aware of that, his life. You understand what I'm saying? Recognizing that life in us, we just decrease. You don't have to try. He just becomes more effective, more potent. And you'll find, without trying, your humanity is taking a back seat. It's not trying to rule and to reign. Amen? I'm a new creation. And I've got to operate from that perspective. I mean, I can't be a human being and think like a dog. The only thing I'm going to get is dog stuff. Right? You cannot be a spirit, a child of God, and operate from a human perspective and think that you're going to get the benefits of who you really are. You've taken a, a lower position, amen, and going to get what only that can get. All right, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. So God has done a bunch of stuff. It's a finished work. I mean, if we understand it, right? It's all past tense in, from a human perspective on a timeline. Amen? Amen? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath, right? He's already done this. Blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Right. Amen? That's where you access it. From the Spirit. It's all there. It's all been given. He hath blessed us. Praise the Lord. Now let me tell you, I, I think I may have shared this one time, this particular word. I can't remember if it was on a Wednesday night or when it was, but, it, but it's worth repeating because it's, it's pretty wild what God does with words, with language. Amen. But you know the word blessing there. In Greek, it's the word eulogia. Or where we get our word for eulogy. Now this is weird. This just blows my mind. It's the same thing we say over somebody who's dead. Ever had to do a eulogy? I mean, I'm not talking about the obituary. I'm talking about the eulogy, right? But it's what you say over a dead person. So how can it be a blessing to have been blessed with a eulogy? It's talking about us. We've been eulogized. Amen? 
That's the word. So how can that be a blessing? Well, what God did when he blessed us is pronounce a eulogy over that old nature, Hallelujah. over that Adamic nature, the old man. Praise the Lord. Do you see what he's saying here? He pronounced, it's dead. And I'm going to bless you or give a eulogy over that old man to announce and to proclaim that in God's eyes, he is dead. Amen? All right. Drop down to verse, I think this is, we're still in Ephesians 1, right? Down to verse 20 and 21. which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Amen. So, when we were born again, we were placed in Christ, and that place is in the heavenlies. Mm -hmm. It's the, the spirit realm, Right? The location of the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and everything that's named in this world or in the world to come, amen, the heavenly is in Christ. It's not X number of miles up into space. It's just the other dimension. It's the spirit realm. It's the spirit dimension. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're not taking a big trip. You're just closing your eyes here, opening your eyes, and you're there. You didn't go anywhere. I mean, you didn't tra have to travel any distance because it's right here. We just don't see it because we're so hung up on this and on this. But God has proclaimed and pronounced a eulogy over that old man that we keep thinking is what it's all about. Praise God. Far above. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at uh, James chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. We're about done. We'll be done. Praise God. Hallelujah. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Just to put you on a guilt trip right off the bat. Here now we're trying to get rid of a guilty conscience, right? Trying to get rid of that sin consciousness. And here he comes dragging us back down into this. It's my job, praise the Lord. <laughs> hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. Right? So what the washing of the water of the word does is make a doer of the word, you, a doer of the word and not a hearer. Right. You understand? The washing of the water of the word is an internal thing. It's the spirit, and it has made you a doer of the word. Yeah. Now, we're still hung up with this external thing, but that's not what God's talking about. Because he said before, if you had ears to hear, you would hear. It wasn't right. that they didn't have these things. Right. It was they weren't hearing spiritually speaking. They weren't seeing the spiritual truths of what God's doing. Amen? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. All right, verse 24. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Who? The guy who's the doer, or who's the hearer, but not the doer. Right? right? right. The natural man. Praise the Lord. So he looks into the mirror or into the word of God, and he sees who he is as far as his new birth is concerned, right? And then he goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he is. Right? So we look into the word of God, and we see what we're talking about here this morning. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the accepted and the beloved. We are joint heirs with Christ. We see all this in here. And then I walk away and go out the door and on my way home, I flip out because somebody, you know, pulls out in front of me or something and 
I'll say something or do something, and immediately I'm now in sin consciousness. I've forgotten who I really am. I'm not saying because of what I did it made me that way. I'm just saying, but now I'm conscious of all of this weakness, Paul called it. Failing, shortcoming. I've forgotten who I am in God because I'm letting facts determine the truth when God has already told me who I am. And it isn't based on anything that I'm doing. It's based on what he already did. See, this is, uh, it's scary because you don't have nothing to do with it. Religion has made millions become rich. I'm talking about religion in general. On the backs of fear, anxiety, guilt, and shame because that's what's preached sin is preached week after week after week after week and so you are conscious of sin all the time because that's all we've ever heard God's plan is that you would hear nothing but grace so that you would no longer be sin conscious the strength of the law is sin or that, that that's what makes the law powerful. Where the law is, sin increases. But when grace comes, it super abounds beyond the sin. So the more you, the more you focus on the rules and your breaking of those rules or the failure of those rules, the less likely you're ever going to really see any success in terms of personal behavior. When you quit worrying about it, it'll happen naturally. I'm not saying you'll ever be perfect. As long as you've got this body, you're going to have some issues. As long as we got this thing, you know, we're going to have to deal with it. But the less I think about the rules and my keeping of those rules, the freer I am, the more accepting I am of God's love, and the less likely I am to dwell on those weaknesses. And if I'm not dwelling on them, I'm less likely to commit them. Because you only do what you think about. Right? I don't want to make it about whether we're doing it or not doing it. I'm just saying the greater success, if it were not true, God wouldn't have set it up this way. This is his plan. A better covenant. Right? One where I will remember their sins and their iniquities I will not account to them. That's the new covenant. He don't know you got any sin. No iniquity is, is attributed to you. You've got a clean record. And you cannot mess it up. It's, it's really, it's the Hebrews 11. Because these people were all abysmal failures when it came to doing what God told them to do. And I'd go down the list, but most of you already heard these things so many times you don't need to know it. But you read about those people and you're thinking, oh, Sarah, didn't she laugh at God when he made this promise? Abraham, didn't he give her away because he was a gutless coward, afraid they were going to kill him? So he says, it's my sister, it's not my wife. And, you know, you know, they ran off when they were supposed to stay. And, you know, none of that's listed. Right. It says God blessed them because of their faith. They received their, their children back from the dead. They, they won victories. They stopped the mouths of lions. I mean, all these things that they did. And there's not one record there of all these failures that we are know there are there because all you got to do is go back to the Old Testament and read it. Right. Why? Because God does not keep any record of anything but their righteousness. Right. Abraham was righteous because he believed, not because he did everything God told him to do the way he told him to do it. I mean, when, when he gets caught lying and giving away his wife, it's him that God tells to pray for the poor slob that didn't even know what was going on. He just took the woman in because she was beautiful, and that was their custom. And the guy was willing to give them to her. And God said, you know, you're, 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 you've got big problems here. And the guy says, why me? I, he, he said it was his sister, I, and I haven't done anything to her. And the Lord said, yeah, and that's why you're still alive today. Because you didn't. 
And then he turns to, to the, to the uh, Pharaoh and he says, look, you need to get my prophet Abraham to pray for you. Now, you know that had to be messing this guy's head up. The guy that got me into all of this mess by lying and conniving, and he's going to pray for me? And something else you might think about. When he prayed for him, what the reason he prayed was because all of the women's wombs had been closed. So they were not able to have any children. There was a whole thing going on there. And here's Abraham, who is the father of many nations but doesn't have any kids of his own. And he's going to pray for him for the condition he's got. And he did, and it worked. Sometimes, you know, God may be telling you to do stuff, and you're saying, I got this issue, you know, man. I can't. How am I going to be praying for this person when I got, the, I got a bigger problem than they do? Forget about it. That might be God's way, not only of blessing them and healing them and delivering them, but setting you free at the same time. Because we know Abraham eventually got the promised child, right? But in the meantime, he was praying for people to have children that couldn't have children, and he couldn't have any. I mean, this is... This is God. That's why I said it takes faith. When God tells you to do something, it's going it's to challenge you. Praise the Lord. So, he looked into the Word of God, saw who he was in Christ, went away doing his own thing, doing his religious works, doing his efforts, or failing to do them, and forgot who he was. Amen? Forgot that he was the righteousness of God in Christ. The new man, amen? The, the way that you can be a hearer and not a doer is to forget what God has said you are. Amen? That's the difference between walking in the truth and walking in facts. Regardless of what they are, whether it's healing, whether it's prosperity, whether it's relationship, it doesn't matter. It all works the same way. We see what's happening around us. See the circumstances, the situations, the people, and so forth, and we forget what the Word says about us, that we are more than conquerors, that we always succeed, that we are blessed to be a blessing. I mean, we just, it's like, I mean, all of us have been there. We get into the thick of the thing, and it's like you forget, you just get stuck on stupid. You just forget, hey, God works miracles through me. God heals the sick. God raises the dead through believers, just through believers. Not, not the really good believers, just believers. Yeah. Praise the Lord. James 1 and verse 25. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What's his deed? Believing. Just simply believing what the word said. God calls that doing. He looks into what? The perfect law of liberty. That's grace. That's what he's talking about. He looks into grace. And God says, that's good works. Right? That's what he said of Abraham, wasn't it? Abraham believed God, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Well, now it's not only accounted to us, it's imputed to us. We don't just have a legal standing of righteousness. We are righteous. Literally. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen? And that's what God calls a doer of the work. Because you're not doing it. The work has been finished. As long as you're operating in grace and faith in that grace, God says it's done. You've kept all the rules. You've done all the work. You've done everything that word requires. And if you don't believe me, go back to Deuteronomy 
and read where he tells him, if you do this, 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 and this, you'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the country, you'll, you'll, your blessings will overtake you, uh, your children will be blessed, you'll be healed, your cattle will be blessed, and everything. In other words, everything, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be whole, sickness and disease can't come on you, all of that stuff. But if you don't, all of these curses and more. Well, guess what? You didn't. But Jesus did. And so every blessing that comes from keeping those rules is ours. That's why God calls us joint heirs with Jesus Christ, because Jesus already finished the work. And we have a right to expect every blessing in the second half there of Deuteronomy. Chapter, what is it? 28. Amen? Read it sometime. I used to read it and think, oh, my God. I, I, you know, I, I'm not getting out of this life without the plague, you know, without total poverty, without because that's what I got coming, because I haven't kept this stuff. I've, I tried pretty hard, and maybe for a day or two I'd be successful in some areas, but I always end up failing. But Jesus did it perfectly, yeah. kept it yeah. totally, and He did it for me, yeah. so that when God looks at me, He sees. Only one column, and it's righteous acts. That's all he sees. And declares me righteous as a result of what Jesus has done, right? All right, back to Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, where we started, and we'll close with this. Praise God. If then ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. This is all we've been talking about here today. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. In other words, think in terms of your spiritual condition and who you are in Christ, not what's happening and going on around you here. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So his glory is revealed in us. Praise the Lord. Miracles, signs, wonders, they're natural to the new creation because it's a spiritual creation. Those are natural for us. It's only supernatural to the natural man. Amen? Amen. We make a big deal out of it. And Jesus did it. He just walking on the water. Just reach out your hand. Little girl, get up. Lazarus, come forth. Everybody's freaking out. Everybody's, my God, my God. And Jesus is not, he's not boastful. He's not arrogant. He's just, he's, he's like, this is natural. This, this is what you do. Now, if you want to say that Jesus is our role model, I disagree with you. Because God's not trying to get us to be perfect like Jesus was. But in the sense of doing the works that Jesus did, Remember the word works, how, how we de- defined it here? By believing yeah. in the grace of God, because that's what Jesus did over and over and over. The works that I do, it's not me that's doing them. Right. It's the Father that's in me. Yeah. It's the Spirit of Christ that's in us that does the works. Amen? Amen. I mean, John and, and, and Peter, why look on us as though we have done some great thing? Yeah. It was Jesus. But they expected miracles to take place because they knew it wasn't about them it was about Jesus if there's a if there's a great divide between the book of Acts and what we see manifesting there through the believers it's not because they were one bit better than us not because they were any holier not because they were any more righteous I can read through there and find they got the same jealousies and and ignorance and and you know, separating issues and all of these things. Come on. They were getting drunk at church. They were still committing fornication with idols in some of the in some of those areas, the pagan areas. Paul doesn't tell them that they're, that they're not saved anymore. Amen? I said a Wednesday night, and I'm closing with this. Fornication, and I'm not saying fornicate. I mean, just, but understand, there's something, a greater truth that God is always trying to tell us. And what is fornication? 
It's anything that is done outside of the covenant. Covenant of marriage. It's having a relationship outside of that covenant. That's why God says the people who are covenant breakers are people who are not keeping the covenant, right? They are fornicators. That's what John talks about in the book of Revelation. How are they, how are they covenant uh, fornicators? Because they're not operating within the covenant, which is grace. It becomes idolatry. You become a fornicator. I mean, that's what God was dealing with Israel all along. I was like a husband to you, and you run off every, after every woman that come by, you know, like a wild ass, he says. You know, you stick your nose in the air, and woo, away you go. Smell that perfume, you know, that Chanel Channel 5? Hallelujah. It'll make you do stupid stuff. Tim? <laughs> Tim's smiling and Please finish, Nathan, before you, you know, when you're, when you're in the hole, quit digging, praise the Lord, but amen. But I, I, I just want you to understand, it's, it's not, we focus so much on the, on the rules when God is really trying to give us a spiritual truth, and the truth is, trust in my grace. Stay in the covenant, that's where your protection is, that's where your provision is, that's where everything resides. So, oh, but it's dangerous when you go by grace. People will do stupid stuff. People are doing stupid stuff all the time, always have, and always will. People are dysfunctional. Whether they're under the law or whether they're under grace. The difference is God blesses that dysfunction and declares it to be righteousness under grace. You won't find any family any more dysfunctional than Abraham's or Isaac's, or Jacob's. Look at their life. Or David. They were dysfunctional. They were screwed up. But God said, through this, I'm going to bring the promise. The deliverer. Me. God himself in flesh. I'm choosing this dysfunction. But I'm declaring it to be righteous. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. So, no, please, don't forget who you are this week. Keep remembering. Every time the devil tries to throw up some thing you've done or don't, just say, shut up and get behind me, Satan. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, and I'm expecting something supernaturally miraculous in my life today and every day. That's your, that's your heritage. Expect miracles. Amen. And then when you get them, just say, well, hallelujah. What was that? Yeah. It was only natural for me. Yeah. Amen. Let, let the world call it miracles. We just call it the provision of our Father. Yeah. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great week. Enjoy the week and the good weather. Especially enjoy the presence of the Lord.